This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of No One Knows by J.T. Ellison. Performed by Terry Schnaubelt and Nick Podell. For Scott, Linda, Laura, Blake, Harlan, and as always, Randy. Part 1 As contraries are known by contraries, so is the delight of presence best known by the torments of absence. Alcibiades Chapter 1 Aubrey, Nashville, Today 1,875 days after Joshua Hamilton went missing, the state of Tennessee declared him legally dead. Aubrey, his wife, or former wife, or ex-wife, or widow, she had no idea how to refer to herself anymore, received the certified letter on a Friday. It came to the Montessori school where she taught, the very one she and Josh had attended as children, came to her door in the middle of reading time, born on the hands of Linda Pierce, the school's long-standing principal, who looked as if someone had died, which, in a way, they had. He had, or so the state of Tennessee had officially declared. Aubrey had been against the declaration of death petition from the beginning. She didn't want Josh's estate settled, didn't want a date engraved on that stupid family stone obelisk that loomed over the graves of his ancestors at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Didn't want to say goodbye forever. But Josh's mother had insisted. She wanted closure. She wanted to move on with her life. She wanted Aubrey to move on with hers, too. She'd petitioned the court for the early ruling, and clearly the courts agreed. Everyone was ready to move on. Everyone but Aubrey. She'd felt poorly this morning when she woke, almost a portent of the day to come. But today was the last day of school before spring break, so she had to show, and be cheery, and help the kids with their party, and give them their extra credit reading assignments. From the second they arrived, her students buzzed around her. It didn't take long for Aubrey to catch the children's enthusiasm and drop her previous malaise. It was a beautiful day. The sun glowed in the sky, dropping beams through the windows, creating slats of light on the multi-hued carpet. The kids spun through the light, whirling dervishes against a yellow backdrop. She didn't even try to contain them. Watching them, she felt exactly the same way. Breaks signaled many things to her, freedom most of all. Freedom to go her own way for a bit, to explore, to read, to gather herself. But when her classroom door opened unexpectedly and Principal Pierce came into the room, the nausea returned with a vengeance and her head started to pound. Aubrey watched her coming closer and closer. Her old friend's face was strained. The furrows carved into her upper lip collapsed in on each other, her yellowed forefinger tapping against the pristine white and blue envelope. She needed to file her nails. What was it about moments? the ones that start with a capital M, that made you notice each and every detail. Aubrey reminded herself of her situation. The children were watching. Trying to ignore the stares of the more precocious ones scattered about the classroom, gifted youngsters whose sensitivity to the emotions of others was finely honed, Aubrey took the letter from Linda, handed off the class into the woman's very capable nicotine-stained hands, and went to the ladies' room in the staff lounge to read the contents. The letter was from her mother-in-law. Aubrey knew exactly what it contained. She tried to pretend her hands weren't shaking. She flipped the lid down on the toilet, locked the door, then sat and ripped open the envelope. Inside was a piece of paper folded into thirds, topped with a handwritten note on a cheery yellow daisy-covered post-it. Aubrey felt that added just the right touch. Her mother-in-law always had been wildly incapable of any form of tact. There was no denying it now. Her hands trembled violently as she unfolded the page. She looked to the handwritten note first. 
The words were carefully formed, a schoolgirl's roundness to the old-fashioned cursive. Aubrey, for your records, Daisy Hamilton. Scribbled in print beneath a painstakingly properly written note were the words, Joshua's mother. Well, no kidding, Daisy, like I could forget. The sticky note was attached to a printout of an email. It was from Daisy's lawyer, the one who'd helped put this vehicle in motion last year, when Daisy decided to petition the courts to have Josh declared legally dead. Aubrey fingered the scar on her lip as she read. Dear Daisy, Per our earlier conversation, attached please find a copy of the order entered from the civil court today by Judge Robinson. As I explained to you on the phone, this order directs the Department of Vital Statistics to issue a death certificate for your son, Joshua David Hamilton, as of April 19 of this year. Now that this order has been officially entered, we should take another look at the estate plan. Josh's life insurance policy will be fulfilled as soon as the declaration is received, and I'd like you to be fully prepared if you plan to contest the contents. I will be forwarding you a final bill for my services on this matter in the next couple of days. Best personal regards, Rick Sager. And now it was official. In the eyes of the law, Joshua David Hamilton was no longer of this earth. No longer Aubrey's husband. No longer Daisy's son. No longer. Aubrey was suddenly unable to breathe. Even though she'd been expecting it, seeing the words in black and white, adorned by Daisy's snippy little missive, killed her. Tears slid down her face, and she crumpled the letter against her thigh. Daisy was a bitch. Always had been, and Aubrey got the message loud and clear. Get over it. Get on with your life. And watch out, kid, because I'm coming for that life insurance money. But just how do you move on when you can't bury your husband? Five years later, there were still no good answers to the puzzle of Josh's evaporation. One minute there, the next gone. Poof. Disappeared. Missing. Kidnapped, hit over the head, and suffering from severe amnesia, or, worse than the idea of his heart no longer beating, he'd chosen to leave her. Dead, but not dead. Without a body, how could they know for sure? Damn you, Josh. He was dead. Even Aubrey had to admit that to herself. It had taken a year to formulate that conclusion. A year of the worst possible days imaginable. As much as she hated to believe he was really gone, she knew he was. Because if he wasn't, he would have let her know. He was the other half of her, the better half, the responsible half, the serious half. For him to be taken or to have run away, no. He would never leave her of his own volition, which meant he must be dead. The circle that was her life, a snake forever eating its tail. Aubrey didn't know the answers to the riddle, only knew that 1,875 days ago, Josh had been nagging at her to hurry up and get in the car because they were late for one of his closest friends' joint bachelor-bachelorette party. That they'd had a serious fender bender on the way to the party, which resulted in the small white scar that intersected Aubrey's top lip in a way that didn't detract from her heart-shaped face. That they'd arrived at the hotel over an hour late, and Aubrey had offered to get them checked in while Josh went to find the groom and join the party. That he'd kissed her deeply before he went, making the cut on her lip throb in time with her heart. That he'd glanced back over his shoulder and given her that devastating half-smile that had been melting her insides since she was seven and he was nine. And he'd pushed her down on the hard playground asphalt and made her cry. That she'd repeated the words of the story so many times it had become mantra. To the police, to the lawyers, to the media, to Daisy, to herself. Her world was broken into thirds. Seven and seventeen and five. Seven years before he came into her life. Seventeen in-between years when she'd seen Josh almost every day. 
Seventeen years of joy and fury and love and sex and marriage and heartache and happiness. Of prepubescent mating rituals, teenage angst, young adult dawning realization, the inescapable knowledge that they couldn't live without each other, culminating in a small wedding and three years of marital bliss. Five years of after. Five years of wondering. She thought they were happy. Late at night in the after time, Aubrey would lie in their bed, still on her side, wearing one of his white Oxford shirts she pretended held the lingering bits of his scent, and wonder, weren't we? Weren't we happy? What was happiness? Where did it come from? How did you measure it? She'd always looked at the little things he did, from a sweet note in whatever book she was reading, to bringing her freshly cut apples when she was vacuuming, or having a travel mug of hot Earl Grey tea waiting for her in the morning as she rushed out the door, as signs that he loved her, that he was happy too. But then he was gone, and she had to pick up the pieces of their once life, shattered like the reflective glass of a broken mirror on the floor. Seven and seventeen, and then five. Five years of emptiness, solitude, loneliness. The state of Tennessee didn't care about any of that. All the state cared about were the cold, hard facts. One thousand eight hundred and seventy-five days ago, Joshua David Hamilton disappeared from the face of the earth. And now enough time had passed that a stranger had declared him legally dead. Chapter 2 Aubrey heard the door to the teacher's lounge open, glanced at her watch. She'd been sitting in the bathroom for nearly an hour, and school was in dismissal. She wiped her eyes, smoothed her unruly hair, straightened her pencil skirt, and emerged to find Linda waiting for her, with a look of genuine compassion on her face. Wonderful Linda, who had never believed the nonsense the district attorney spouted and gave Aubrey her teaching job back the moment she got out of jail, even though they lost students over her rehiring. Aubrey accepted a hug from the older woman. You okay? Linda asked. I suppose, Aubrey answered. She handed Linda the letter, stared at her own left hand while Linda read. She still wore the wedding band and engagement ring Josh had placed on her finger. The small half-carat diamond solitaire, all he could afford at the time, was still a very high-quality stone. It flashed in the overhead fluorescent light, sparkling, and Aubrey remembered an old wives' adage. When your ring smiles, your man is thinking of you. Her man. Her man was gone. How was he thinking of her? Looking down upon her from heaven? She used to believe in things like heaven and God and faith and saviors. Hope. No more. She'd been living in purgatory too long to believe in anything but hell for sinners anymore. Linda folded the paper and slowly put it back into the envelope. Her brown eyes were soft and compassionate. I see your mother-in-law hasn't changed a lick. Daisy is as Daisy does. At least there's one constant in my life. I doubt she'll ever change. She's always been this way. Even when you were children, she was... difficult. Sometimes Aubrey forgot that Linda had known Daisy longer than Aubrey had. Linda had been a part of the school for more than twenty years now, rising up the ranks. She'd been friends with Aubrey's mother, but not Josh's. Very few women were friends with Daisy. Linda slid to the window and glanced out. The lounge faced the playground on the back of the school, empty now that the children were headed home. It was the perfect sanctuary when the teachers needed a smoke. Linda's ancient Zippo lighter flared, and a quick breeze came through the slitted glass. Aubrey smelled the fragrant oil, nearly drifted back in time again, but the snap of the metal brought her back. Linda blew a long stream of blue smoke out the window, smiled at her young friend. More than one constant, Aubrey. Are you working tonight? Aubrey made ends meet, working two jobs now teaching at the Montessori school, and working part-time at Frothy Joe's, a coffee shop near her house. She shook her head. She had the evening off. 
Why don't you join me, then? It's open mic night at Frothy Joe's. We can have a little dinner afterward. That's kind of you, Linda, but I think I'll pass. I need... time. Time. Stupid excuse, Aubrey. She'd had five years already. What were another few hours going to gain her? Linda set the burning cigarette on the window ledge and took both of Aubrey's hands in hers. Aubrey, listen to me. You are entering dangerous territory here. You have to keep moving forward. You can't shut down again. We nearly lost you last time. If you're not up for dinner out tonight, why don't I come over and make you something instead? Alone, alone, alone. I want to be alone. Aubrey shook her head. Her voice was still unsteady, but she drew a deep breath and forced a smile. I'll be okay, Linda. Promise. I'm going to draw a bath, pour a glass of wine, and relax. Nothing about tonight is different from the past five years' worth of nights. Josh is still gone. This is just a piece of paper for his mother so she can get the closure she so wants. It doesn't mean anything more. She's going to contest the life insurance policy. Let her. I don't want Josh's money anyway. Linda looked doubtful, but, good friend that she was, simply hugged Aubrey to her chest, silently released her. The cloud of cigarette smoke settled on Aubrey's blouse, and she nearly choked. Back to her classroom, down the now quiet hallways, the mantra ringing in her ears. Alone, alone, alone. Aubrey gathered her purse and keys and walked to the parking lot. The third-hand Audi Quattro she and Josh had wrecked the afternoon of his disappearance sat forlornly in the parking lot. She needed to get a new car. It had started leaking oil last month, and she didn't have the money to get it properly fixed, but she was loath to part with this one. Josh was so proud the day they bought it, so happy that he'd managed to get such a great deal. She'd gotten the damage to the front bumper and hood fixed, made sure it got regular oil changes and rotated the tires. Other than the small leak, it ran well enough, reliably turning over day after day. But it was a constant reminder. She sat in the driver's seat, stared at the odometer. Death is an inevitability. Aubrey knew that. People will die, and the essence that was their soul will go wherever they believe it will go, and a new life will join the world in their place. Wax and wane. Yin and yang. Even her car would die one day, and she'd have to remove yet another link to her previous life. Perhaps this was what she'd been waiting for. Perhaps the fact that Josh had been declared dead would help her find the internal fortitude to finally move on. If the state agreed, then she could mourn and grieve properly— and wake to a new day, a new life. If there were any way to move past this. Home was ten minutes from school. She managed to get there without forgetting a single stop sign. The house on West Linden Avenue was looking a bit shabby around the edges. Not that it had ever looked smart and polished. Aubrey did the best she could, relied on the kindness of the people around her to help with the projects she couldn't manage on her own, but the harsh winter had stripped away the last vestiges of paint around the eaves and bleached the shutters, making the whole outside look shaggy and worn. She'd have to paint before summer was over. She'd been forced to give up their gorgeous house in leafy, tony green hills to pay her legal bills. The house on Woodmont was one they'd dreamed of and saved for, scrimping even more than usual. A no-interest loan made it reachable, if not affordable, on their meager salaries. A house to grow into, Josh said, hinting at a future filled with love and laughter and the pitter-patter of tiny feet. The day they'd closed had been triumphant. They'd moved in with hardly any furniture, just enough to make it look like someone was squatting in the house. That first night they'd had pizza and a bottle of Corbel champagne, the best they could afford, the only they could afford, and built a fire in the fireplace, even though it was still warm outside. They made love in front of the fire, and fell asleep in the midst of their own party. Content. Their house belonged to someone else now, and Aubrey lived in the shabby little house on West Linden, on the other side of the highway, 
because the life insurance policy underwritten on Josh was tied up since there was no body, and Aubrey had been forced to sell their dream to make ends meet. Moving away from their house tore her apart. Even though she knew he was dead, a little voice in the back of her head whispered, When he comes home, he won't know where you are. Angels are supposed to follow you everywhere, though, watching, guarding, caring. Someone would show him, tell him, or not. Looking forward wasn't the hardest element of the path she was on. The overlying specter of making a mistake, of doing something that would sever the connection with her previous life, had drowned out all her other worries and concerns. And yet, today, coming home felt different. Was it acceptance? Sorrow? Freedom? She couldn't put it into words, didn't even try, defying the therapist's orders that she accept each emotion as it came to her, examine it minutely, then let it go so she wouldn't get dragged into the undertow of sadness. A handy tool if one was truly able to disconnect from the moment-by-moment, all-consuming emotions that came with losing your husband. She pulled into the concrete drive, turned off the car and let it settle, then headed into the kitchen, dropping her bag on the counter as she went. She heard the scrabble of nails, the joyous woof. Winston, their, her, Weimaraner, came wiggling into the kitchen. He pushed his wet nose into her hand and turned his sleek blue-gray body sideways into her legs, a warm, weighty comfort. Without Winston, she didn't know if she would have made it through. More than a companion, he'd become the man in her life, a platonic four-legged husband. She dropped to her knees and gathered him close. How's my baby? She crooned, rubbing her fingers into his silken ears. He arched his neck in pleasure, rewarded her attentions with a gentle lick on the nose, then went to the door and sat expectantly, blue eyes smiling. He'd always been a happy dog. They'd found him in a box on the side of the road, one Sunday when they'd gone on a drive in the country, down Highway 96 into Williamson County. Green grass and cows and a puppy. Aubrey had spied the small gray tail sticking out of the cardboard. Josh had pulled the car to the shoulder to investigate. The puppy, thin, tired, looked up at them with such trust. There'd been no question about keeping him. They'd bundled him home, fed and watered him, trained him to a pad, and been worshipped in return. They named him for Churchill, Josh's childhood fascination. Winston missed Josh. Sometimes Aubrey called and he didn't come, and she knew where she'd find him, in the laundry room, curled on a ratty old ragbag sweater of Josh's, inconsolable. She didn't blame him. If she had the choice, she'd have gone to sleep on Josh's sweater, too, and never woken up. She let Winston out into the backyard, climbed the short staircase to her bedroom, changed and tied on her sneakers. A run might help clear her head. She went back downstairs and opened the sliding door. Winston, want to run? Sometimes Winston came along, sometimes he didn't. She always left it up to him. The dog was having a tussle fight with one of his chew toys. He glanced up at her, and she could swear she saw him shrug. Today he chose to stay in the backyard. She locked the door behind her and tied her key to her shoelace. Always careful, Aubrey. She set a brisk pace, let the soothing motion of her feet carry her toward oblivion. For the first couple of years after Josh was gone, after the investigation was finished, after she was exonerated, she'd come home to the shabby little house, let Winston out, and open a bottle of wine. When she started opening a second bottle before she went to bed, when she'd withdrawn so far that she started missing work because she was still passed out from the night before— and had her little accident, she was forced into a moment of clarity and stood back to examine her life. The consensus? She was trying to dull the pain. It was a big pain, one that needed to be dulled. But nothing was working. The therapy, the drinking, work, her friends, the dog, the occasional suicidal ideation, none of that was taking enough of the edge off so she could sleep at night. 
so she could function, so she could stop missing him so very badly. An escape was a necessity. She had to have something to do. Drowning in her sorrows, literally, wasn't going to work. It wasn't helping, and Josh would be embarrassed by it. In all things, his approval mattered the most to her. Even dead, she sought his admiration. So she turned to running. The first mile was behind her now, and she hit her stride. She never planned her route beforehand, changed it up depending on her energy level that day and her level of paranoia. After her brief stints in jail, the horror story she'd heard, she knew enough to vary her routines. Today, breath was her friend, her salvation. It gave her purpose, renewed her spirit, cleansed her worries. She let the air flow into her lungs as she pushed harder, up the rolling hills of her neighborhood, legs pumping, sweat drying in the cool air, skimming past the school, the new construction, monstrous houses replacing the small cottages, onto the grounds of Vanderbilt University. She circled the campus. Five miles in now, and the sky was purpling with the impending sunset. She needed to turn back, but pushed for another ten minutes, then swerved across Blakemore and dashed into Dragon Park, until she hit the tree. Their tree. She pulled up short, caught by surprise. She hadn't intended to come here. She was trying to escape, and instead she'd run headlong into her past. The tree was a century-old oak, a witness to most love affairs in town. The gnarled bark had been stripped clean, replaced with a full-sleeve tattoo of carvings. There wasn't a square inch untouched from the ground six feet up the tree's height. Aubrey turned to go. She didn't need to see it, didn't want to see it, but a gossamer thread of desire pulled her back to the north-facing side of the tree. There, carved in the hard oak flesh, intertwined inside a crooked heart, were the letters J-D-H plus A-M-T equals T-L-A. Josh David Hamilton plus Aubrey Marie Trenton equals true love always. He'd carved it for the first time when they were 13 and 11, respectively. Each year on their anniversary, they came back and he carved it again, deeper and deeper into the tree. For some reason, other lovers seemed to respect their mark and didn't try to carve over it. She ran her fingers over the letters and allowed herself a moment, a capital M moment. No one needed to know. She didn't have to report into her therapist. She could have this for herself, this last wallow in her past, ignore the knife stroke against her heart. There were no tears. She couldn't allow that. But she could allow herself to think back to that night, the longest night of her life, the night Josh disappeared. Chapter 3 Aubrey Five years ago. The accident. On the way to the party, in his rush, Josh rear-ended a black sedan driven by an older man. Aubrey would never forget the look on the man's face when he came roaring out of the car to scream at Josh. His rage made her shrink back against the seat. But just as quickly, concern over the car and worry for Josh drove her out to face him. The man's car was barely dented, the bumper of their precious Audi was caved in, sagging to the left as if exhausted by its ordeal. Josh was physically fine, just bruised, and Aubrey was as well, except for the small piece of flying glass from the broken passenger side window that hit her mouth and sliced her upper lip. She was ministered to by her husband at the scene. Two stitches worth of thread and a butterfly bandage from the kit Josh always carried closed the tiny gash. She should have listened to him and gone to a plastic surgeon to have it repaired properly. But she would hear nothing of it. Josh was in his third year of medical school, with plans to become a family practitioner, or maybe a surgeon, he hadn't decided. But stitches, that was med school 101. It seemed wrong, somehow hypocritical, not to take his care for herself. 
When things were wrapped at the accident scene, they texted their friends that they were okay and hurrying, then called a cab to take them to the Opryland Hotel. Late and anxious, Josh kissed her at the concierge stand and hurried away to the bachelor party. Aubrey snuck into the girl's extravaganza, took a seat in a low chair in the back of the room, and discreetly rubbed her neck. Her mood was dampened by the accident, yes, but she already despised the forced hilarity of the traditional bachelorette event, the shrieking girls ogling an oiled-up beefcake and a ridiculously tiny thong shaking his package in their faces, while they played some random game of touch and shoot. The stripper touches you, you have to do a shot. She was embarrassed by the looks they were getting from the people around them, half pitying, half jealous. Aubrey knew these girls, knew every single one of them was internally rolling her eyes and wishing she could just be somewhere else. But for some reason, they were all in the back room of the restaurant, drunk, surrounding a half-naked man like a pack of starving wolves, and throwing dollar bills at him, pretending they were having the time of their lives. The stripper moved closer to Aubrey, and she instinctively pulled back, then half-heartedly tossed a dollar at him. There was no way on God's green earth she was going to let his sweaty hip touch her. When the attention focused on the next woman, she edged away from the group and slipped out to the ladies' room, splashed a little water on her face, glanced at her wide brown eyes and the unruly mess of Medusa-like curls that crowned her head. The straightening shampoo her hairdresser had talked her into was a joke. Even with an hour of excessive flat ironing, there was no way to tame her tresses into any semblance of smooth, silky waterfall hair. She'd wasted that fifteen bucks. Looking back, she kicked herself. They were going to need every dime to pay for the repairs on the car. Her lip was swollen, the little stitches slightly bloody beneath their butterfly bandage, like a sepia train track. People paid good cash money to get their lips this puffy. Little did they know a simple car accident could save them thousands in surgical procedures. She started back to the group. High-pitched squealing made her stop short. Janie, the bride, was being molested by the stripper now, twirling and dancing in his arms. God, she must really be hammered. All this crew was concerned with was getting as loaded as possible, as quickly as possible, and it looked like the drinks had done the trick. They were up to their ears in the party's signature cocktail, pink piña coladas. Aubrey was allergic to coconut, so every time the wait staff moved through with the concoctions on their trays, Aubrey passed. But she did want something. No one would notice if she disappeared for a longer stretch. This party wasn't about her. No one would miss her. She walked down the hallway to the first quiet bar she found. The Opryland Resort was gigantic. It housed multiple restaurants and bars, all situated along a garden-like atrium on the lowest level of the hotel, each with a different theme, a commercial identity crisis like no other. You can't be all things to all people, but Opryland was trying. And, truth be told, she wanted to check on Josh. He wouldn't mind. She knew he wouldn't. He was probably worrying about her this very second, just as she was worried about him. They had a connection like that. She could think of him, and he'd call, almost as if she'd summoned him. The silence of the bar was welcome. She settled herself on a stool and sent him a text. Utterly bored. Come meet me for a drink? I'm in the Jack Daniels lounge. Five minutes passed with no word. She figured he was distracted and hadn't looked at his phone, and wondered what, exactly, the groom, Kevin Sulman, and his friends had devised for the male cohort's entertainment that had her husband so transfixed. Strippers, probably, though Sulman had claimed to his bride-to-be that he was skipping the tradition. Janie had assured him she would follow suit. So much for that. And, if there were strippers... Josh was a healthy young man, and would certainly be looking. Aubrey tamped down the spurt of anger. He would look, but he wouldn't touch. He'd promised. And she trusted him. She gathered her purse and phone to leave, when a waiter came through from the back of the bar with a tray balanced on his hand. Centered perfectly was a single highball of clear liquid, 
garnished with a slice of lime. He caught her eye, made a beeline to her seat, set the drink on the bar in front of her with a smile, then turned with a flourish and disappeared back the way he'd come. She hadn't even had time to grab her wallet from her bag. She sniffed the drink, and a wide smile broke over her face. Tangeray and tonic, her favorite. Josh was such a silly romantic. She loved that about him the most. He was surprising and fun and smart and sexy and wonderful. But under all of that ran a streak of romanticism that would make Eris proud. Like sending a gin and tonic to her in the middle of a boring party. More than a drink. A promise. She settled back onto the bar stool to wait for him, expecting him to appear from around the corner with a sly grin on his face, tickled to death that he'd surprised her. Texted him again. You are the best husband ever, and waited. Aubrey sipped the drink and let the cool, piney taste coat the back of her throat. Once again, considering how incredibly lucky she was. Having money would be nice, but it couldn't buy her the love of a good man, or friendship, or the kind of happy, settled contentment she'd always felt when she thought of her husband, the things she valued most in this world. She thought back to their own wedding three years earlier, a quiet, subdued affair, but, in her mind, much more fun. They'd both been excited, a little nervous. Josh's hands had shaken when he put the ring on her finger, but his voice never wavered as he said his vows. She didn't remember all the details, but would never forget looking into his denim blue eyes as he said the words that would bind them together forever. She'd gotten goosebumps so strong was his intensity, and she knew he meant every word down to his bones. She glanced at her watch. She'd sent the first text at 9.45 p.m. It was now almost 10.15. Her drink was three-quarters gone. She toyed with the lime on the edge of the glass. Where was he? She had a nice little debate with herself. She was tired, sore and bruised from the accident. The drink had made her sleepy, and they had a beautiful king-size bed waiting upstairs. Share a hot bath, maybe get crazy and raid the minibar, definitely break in the bed. These things sounded like heaven. So if he wasn't going to come to her, the least she could do was go to him. She finished the drink, wound her way through the acreage of the hotel to the concierge desk, and asked where the Salmon party was taking place. The concierge didn't hesitate, told her the room number immediately, which gave Aubrey pause. Did he think she was part of the entertainment? Her dress wasn't that revealing, was it? She turned her back and started toward the bachelor party. To be fair, she was always fair with him. She texted Josh. Thanks for the drink. I'm coming to get you. We have things to do upstairs. Ended with a smiley face. She got lost immediately. The hotel was so big that she didn't know how the people who worked there found their way around. Fifteen minutes passed. Twenty. She was hopelessly lost. Finally, a man dressed in the pink and gold livery of the hotel appeared around a corner. She flagged him down, and he showed her to one of the little golf carts that buzzed around the site. I'll take you. Hop in. It's on the other side of the property. A two-minute ride. She got into the cart, wondered if this qualified as getting in the car with a stranger. It was chilly. The sun had long since disappeared, and the early spring evening fought with the last vestiges of winter for control. Where are you from? Aubrey started. Oh, I'm local. We're here for a wedding. My husband and I, that is. He smiled. No worries. We see lots of people like you here. Aubrey's back stiffened. The damn dress. She did look like a stripper. Or a swinger. Or something else equally unsavory. The man didn't say anything more just pulled up to a pink and gold building with lounge written on the doors. Here you go, ma'am. He waited, and she opened her purse and fished out a dollar. He took the money with a smile and buzzed off, leaving her standing alone in the dark. The door to the lounge sprang open, and one of Josh's best friends, 
Arlo Tonturian stumbled out. His eyes were nearly crossed, but he recognized Aubrey. Hey, hey, sexy lady. You must excuse me for a moment. He weaved over to the bushes and proceeded to vomit. Yes, she definitely arrived in the right place. She didn't want to wait. She wanted to go inside, grab Josh, go to bed. But Arlo was in pretty bad shape. So she went to him and put a hand on his back. Can I help? He retched again, stood up, spit a few times. He looked slightly more normal, but still pale and still drunk. Jesus, why do I ever agree to Jaeger bombs? Shit makes me sick every time. Josh not feeling good either? I don't know. He's been doing Jaeger bombs too? Great. They didn't make him sick, but they certainly didn't make him amorous. More like passed out cold. Arlo gave her another slightly cross-eyed look. He never showed, princess. And trust me, Solomon is mightily pissed. Chapter 4 Aubrey was getting annoyed. You're drunk, Arlo. Josh is inside. He took off for the party the minute we arrived. She glanced at her phone. It was nearly midnight. That was over three hours ago. We were late. We had an accident on the way over. Didn't you hear? Arlo rubbed his eyes and gave her that soft grin he used when he wanted to be charming. I'm drunk, all right, as a fucking skunk. But he ain't inside. We called his cell phone, but he never answered. He's missing the strips, too. They have tatas. Arlo's face turned white. You didn't hear that. Don't tell Janie. She's not cool like you. So Salman had fallen prey to the strippers. I won't say anything. Aubrey reached for the door, but Arlo stumbled over and slammed it shut. No way, sexy lady, you can't go in there. Men only. He looked a little more sober now, and Aubrey shook her head. God knew what Salman was up to in there, or Josh. Was that why Arlo was blocking her way? Was Josh doing something he shouldn't have been? She had a flash of anger and jealousy so intense that she felt like if she didn't scream, she'd explode. No. No way. He would never. Not after. She shouldered Arlo out of the way and flung the door open. His slurry voice followed her down the dark hallway. Aubrey! Aubrey, really! You don't want to go in there! She stormed into the corridor and followed the noise. A heavy bass beat thumped in time with her slamming heart. She pulled the double doors open and strode into the bacchanal. Her eyes took a few moments to adjust to the gloom. When they did, her first emotion was relief. What she saw wasn't terribly shocking. Not great, but it could have been worse. Kevin Sulman, the groom, was being kissed and groped rather forcefully by a random stripper and looking like he was enjoying her attentions. A few of the boys had their hands and mouths in places that they shouldn't have, but no one was naked but the hired girls. And there was no Josh. What the hell? Arlo was right behind her. He grabbed her by the waist and yanked her from the room. The doors swung closed, but the music barely faded. Arlo pulled her by the hand down the corridor and into the parking lot. He was humming under his breath. Once they hit the tarmac, he put both hands on her shoulders. His breath was sour on her face. Obs, you can't say anything to Janie. She will roast Solomon on a spit. She won't, Arlo, but I don't care about them. Where is Josh? I told you he didn't show. He stepped back, fumbled in his pocket for a pack of cigarettes. We thought he either felt bad after the accident or y'all decided to go home. In our imaginary car? Aubrey heard the note in her voice. Heard it, and it scared her. She'd gone up several decibels and an octave all at once. Arlo heard it, too. He stopped fumbling with his smokes. Don't freak, Aubrey. Have you called him? Yes, he's not answering. 
Her breath started to come short. What if Josh was dead? An intracranial bleed caused by the accident. A collapsed lung. A pneumothorax. All those terms she'd been helping him study for the past three years tumbled around with the threatening panic inside her head. Maybe he was in the emergency room right now, intubated, unable to talk, unable to call her and let her know. As she rang Josh's phone again, she asked Arlo, Do you know the way to the main hotel? Yeah, it's through the back of this place. You came the long way around, I take it? Yes, I want to check the room. Show me the fastest way back. He tossed his cigarette on the ground and pulled the door open for her. She followed, phone to her ear. Josh's voicemail clicked on. She left him a message. Followed Arlo past the thumping walls of the party, out into a long corridor that attached back to the hotel lobby. Damn concierge had sent her the wrong way. But she didn't care about that now. They found the first elevator up, and she hit the button for the fourth floor. It took forever. Aubrey thought she'd lose her mind. She had her key in one hand and the phone, steadily redialing, in the other. The doors finally dinged open, and she took off at a run toward their room. She wrestled with the key card but got the door open. The room was empty. Aubrey knew then something was wrong. Very, very wrong. Like that sixth sense that tells you when something bad is going to happen, and the phone rings with news that someone you love is sick or has died. She tried to stay focused. Maybe he'd gone back to the house for something. She rang their home phone, but the machine picked up, with that stupid, goofy message they'd recorded one night when they'd both had too much to drink. Individually, This is Aubrey. And this is Josh. Together, these are the voyages of the Starship Hamilton. Our mission? To bodily go where no married couple has gone before. Which means we're really busy right now. You know what to do. No one but friends had the home number. All their business was done on their cell phones. But she really needed to change that message. At the beep, she said, Josh? Hon, where are you? I'm at the hotel looking for you. Call me as soon as you get this, okay? Arlo was finally catching her concern. Maybe he went home? Aubrey looked at him sharply. I just called. He's not answering there either. Let's check with the hotel staff. Maybe he left a message for me downstairs. She wrote a note and left it on the bed. They went to the front desk. She fought the urge to run carefully placing one heeled foot in front of the other. She ignored Arlo's occasional assurances that things would be fine, that they'd find him. With every step, she said a little prayer, which quickly became a loop in her head. Please be okay. Please be okay. Please be okay. When she knew in her heart, things were never going to be okay again. Chapter 5 Aubrey, today. That was the moment. The moment that changed during into after. Where the seven and seventeen ended and the five began. A beeping car horn pulled Aubrey back from her reverie. She looked up to see the intersection crowded with drivers, all of them heading into their own worlds, their own lives. Stars of their own plays. What did all those people do? Strangers who passed her each and every day. Did they have sorrow and pain and loss like she did? Surely she wasn't the only person in the world who suffered, by whatever means. Her therapist had once tried to get her involved in a group therapy grief program. It had been a complete disaster. The people in the group were just so... damaged. There was a dizzying array of loss on parade, from the woman whose young daughter had drowned in the bathtub while she went to answer the phone, to the man who'd run his car into a tree and killed his girlfriend, to the quiet teenager who'd shared some bad ecstasy with her best friend, resulting in the girl having a heart attack on the dance floor of their favorite club. Aubrey didn't fit into their construct. 
They all had answers. Funerals to attend. Bodies to bury. Self-flagellation to attend to. Especially seeing as everyone in the group was somehow responsible for the death of their loved one. Now, Aubrey, responsibility and accidents are different beasts entirely. You know that. Bullshit. Aubrey had no anchors. She had no body, no closure, and certainly bore no responsibility for Josh's death. For a time, they didn't even know for sure that he was truly gone. For a time. Two things were certain. Aubrey hadn't killed her husband. And she knew Josh had sent her the gin and tonic that night. It had to be him. But he never came to her rescue. Through the weeks of investigation, police harassment, the legal proceedings, the trial, the months that turned into years, through the moments when during became after, when Aubrey could finally sleep through the night without thinking about the handcuffs being slapped around her wrists and the hard metal of the county jail pallet they called a bed under her body, when she was set free and came back to their empty home and startled dog and faced his mother's decision to petition the courts to declare Josh dead so she could steal away the insurance money. He never came. He never came. She had to reconcile the silly romantic she'd married with the concept of a man so callous, so vengeful, that he would allow the woman he claimed to love to be dragged through the mud, accused of his murder, hounded by the press, the police, without stepping forward to save her. She couldn't. Josh would never let that happen. And that's why she knew, without a doubt, that he was dead. More traffic noise, and she jumped. How much time had she just lost? Her lizard brain reacted. Run more. She did, running away from the tree, away from the happy and the sad, up the hill into the darkness, one foot in front of the other, again and again and again. Chapter 6 Daisy Today Daisy Hamilton ran her finger along the icy tumbler of vodka, her third in as many minutes. She tossed the freezing alcohol against the back of her throat, filled the glass to the brim one more time, shoved the bottle back into the freezer, and took the shot onto her back deck. She sat hard in the Adirondack chair that faced the gardens and lit a Virginia Slim. The letter from Rick Sager sat on the table next to her, mocking. The promise of the money, mocking. The promise of closure, mocking. When the phone call came this morning, rapidly followed by the letter, Daisy went into overdrive. She needed someone to share in her sadness, her horror, her fear. Aubrey was the first person who came to mind. The first one who always came to mind. The loss of Josh wasn't enough punishment for that girl. Daisy wanted to tear her open and watch her bleed on the pavement. Dropping the envelope at that little bitch's school had consumed her. She needed the girl to hurt, just like Daisy hurt, though she didn't know why she bothered. Aubrey was as walled off as they came. Daisy had always thought Aubrey was one of those people who had no emotions, no conscience, a sociopath. But if that were the case... Would Josh have married her in the first place? She'd never be able to ask him. When she pulled out of the Montessori parking lot, her pointless arrow slung, Daisy had driven aimlessly around town, looking at all the places Josh played as a little boy. She ignored the transparent ghost of the girl, stuck to him like glue, sapping all of his energy, pulling his attention away from the only woman who truly loved him, She'd stopped for a drink. Just one. Fortified, she'd driven through town to the Mount Olivet Cemetery office and given them the second date for the gravestone. An expiration date. She sipped the vodka. Thought back the way she always did. Wondered if she would ever have peace. It started on a Tuesday. A Tuesday that should have been like every other Tuesday before, 
not like every Tuesday to come. Daisy had been making cookies, and the hours spent standing and stirring and bending before the oven made the crick in her back flare up, the one that started several years earlier after she'd fallen down the stairs. She knew she should stop and take some ibuprofen, but she wanted to get this last batch in the oven. Then she could rest. Then she could give in to the nagging pain that was her life. But the door to the garage slammed, and in came her son, calling like a frightened jaybird. Mama! 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 Her heart had sped up for a moment, then calmed. She recognized the alarm in his voice, she who was so attuned to every nuance of her child, every cry, every smile, every tear, every tooth, the way the skin on the inside of his arms was silky smooth, and the scent of his hair told her he needed a bath, and the after, when he bundled into the towel, wet and clean and sleepy in her arms. His voice was filled with distress, but he was not hurt or in physical pain. His concern was for another. Probably a squirrel hit by a car, or a bird flown into the window. Nothing to worry about. Nothing that couldn't be soothed with a kiss and a cookie. How wrong she was. Josh had skidded into the kitchen, his rumpled hair sticking up in the back, the cowlick that refused to be tamed no matter what she did to it. Mama! She turned to him, wiping her hands on a dish towel. Josh, stop yelling, I'm right here. Mama, something awful's happened. Awful. To a ten-year-old, that could be anything from dropping his toothbrush in the toilet to remembering the toad he'd left in the pocket of the jeans she had just put in the wash. Awful was running out of milk to go with his cookies. Awful was relative. What happened, Josh? Her voice was weary. She hadn't meant it to be. She didn't know exactly when it started. The lassitude. The first time Ed had hit her, maybe? When she asked for the restraining order. When she'd filed the divorce papers and he'd come screaming at the door, the police having to cart him away. When she'd remarried, Tom, good, steady, boring Tom, who didn't drink, didn't hit, and loved Josh like his own child? She was a good mother. She'd done all the right things for her son. Her happiness was irrelevant in the face of his love and joy. So what if she felt trapped? Mama! Mrs. Pierce told us Aubrey's parents went to heaven. She'd set the wooden spoon she was using to mix the cookie dough on the sideboard and wiped her hands on the dish towel. Josh had stood five feet from her, his eyes wild, tears threatening to spill over. He thought he was too old to cry and was fighting his emotions so hard. She took him by the hand and went to the table, sat down, and pulled him between her knees. The accident had happened three days before. One of those things, her mind told her. One of those things that happened to other families. The Trentons, good people, town favorites, hired a babysitter for their young daughter, Aubrey, had themselves a night out on the town, and managed to get sideswiped by a tractor trailer on their way home. The story had made the late local news. Daisy had been drinking a glass of wine and stopped short when she saw the accident scene, the crushed car, the yellow drape. She hardly noticed spilling a bit of wine down the front of her shirt. Her mixed emotions. Daisy had taken an instant dislike to Marie Trenton, who always managed to make her feel like an incompetent harpy. Marie was a fixture on the Montessori's PTA, perpetually in charge, always put together always gentle in her rebukes. She was sorry for their deaths, of course she was. But something in her couldn't help but feel like Marie Trenton had gotten exactly what she deserved. But she couldn't say that to Josh. They had an accident. I know you must be scared, sweetie, but nothing is going to happen to your daddy or me, I promise. I know that. Why didn't anyone tell me? Josh was going through an adult stage where he felt everything needed to be shared with him. He was right this time, though. She should have told him. 
He liked playing with the little Trenton girl, and the school was so small. Surely they were all talking about it today. She'd had a flash of anger toward Linda Pierce, Josh's teacher. She should have called to warn Daisy she was going to share this momentous news with Daisy's son. But how do you explain a sudden death to a child? Why hadn't Daisy told him herself? Perhaps because Josh had lived through Ed. Though he didn't, couldn't, remember, and she wanted to shelter him from more pain. Sweetie, sometimes things that happen to grown-ups aren't good for children to hear. That answer wasn't going to be good enough. She saw his mind begin to churn. He bit his lip and leaned into her. She enveloped her son in a hug, and he whispered in her ear, But Aubrey has no one. Where will she go? This was...